always worries me when people clap before I speak because I'm not sure that'll happen after so that's kind of a combination of things. Um, we've got about 30 minutes where uh, they've given me uh, some things that they'd love me to discuss around our business and what we do, what it means to be an entrepreneur and then we'll take about 20 minutes with questions and answers and uh, just spend a little bit of time there. But before we do that, I'd like to get just a little bit of grounding in who's here. So let me ask a couple of questions. Um, how many of you would either like to work for yourselves or start a business? Better raise a hands. I'll keep them up for me a minute. So almost everyone in the room. Okay. Well, that's a good place to start, huh? Um, I've been in business for myself for 23 years. Uh, I guess 24 this year and uh, took the corporate route first with full intention of doing that. Let's spend some time today on what that means. How many of you think it's a risk to start your own business or work for yourself? Yeah? What percentage succeed? Talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Does it depend on the industry? Uh, depends on the industry, but there's a general across the rule of firms that start each year that are employers. And what percent is succeeding? Anybody have any idea? What? Ten, no? No more than that. About 40% fail within the first two years. Can't make it past the first two years. And about 60% within the first four. And uh, I'll kind of show you the ratio of the fact that new businesses starting and versus or against businesses going out of business are almost equal on a yearly basis in the United States, which is pretty interesting. So with all that said, how many of you are going to get married? Raise your hands. Get married. How many of you are married? How many of you intend to get married? Keep your hands up. Okay, what percentage of marriages fail? About 50%. It's about the same ratio. Right? So if you're willing to take a risk to get married and you do things right, from a business perspective, you've got just as good a chance to succeed in a business as you do a marriage. In fact, if you're me, much better chance to succeed in your business than you did in your first marriage. Right? That's, come on, there's a little humor in that, <laughs> especially for my wife back in the back. This is Cindy back in the back, and uh, introduce everybody to Cindy. So the truth is, is starting your own business is a big deal, and there's a lot of opportunity there, and the risk profile goes up, and I want to just give you kind of a little bit of perspective on who we are and what we do. We're a leadership consulting company that focuses on fulfilling the promise of leadership. Now, what does that mean? So every time we have a leader either emerge or get appointed to something, we have expectations of that leader. True or not true? Right? Do you have expectations of the people who are in leadership positions around you? Either formal or informal? Absolutely. And those expectations we have of a leader are either spoken or unspoken. You think it's ever the case that leaders don't know what people expect of them? Expectations that are actually not articulated? Absolutely, all the time. When we go into organizations, we find that a significant portion of the success of an organization from a leadership perspective and ultimately results is based on how effective leaders are at keeping the promises that are made either in implicitly or explicitly. That makes sense? Because we violate them all the time. I'll see you at 2 o'clock this afternoon. I show up at 2.15. If a leader does that, an expectation has been violated. A promise has been broken. All the way to the bigger ones. Enron. Any expectations violated or promises broken at Enron? Yeah? Like my entire security and the rest of my life? All because I trusted you? I mean, Ken Lay will go down in history as what? The one guy that was the biggest violator of one of top ten anyway of promises. And there's a whole line of those guys. Men and women. So our business is all about helping leaders fulfill the promise of leadership. And we do it, first of all, from four perspectives. We think there's four basic promises that take place in an organization. Leaders are responsible for setting direction and ensuring that meaning exists. Leaders are responsible for making sure that people are engaged and there's an opportunity for commitment. If we actually are inside an organization, we have an expectation that the value which we can provide will be able to be provided. We actually going to be tapped for our value. By the way, what percent of potential do you think most employees in the United States believe is tapped on what they can actually deliver? Any idea? 20, 30. 
If you go in and you ask the question, which we've been doing for 25 years, what percentage of your potential is tapped in this organization? We get an average around 25 or 30 percent in most organizations. Untapped resource. Expectation around promise, around engagement and commitment. Promise around making sure the organization's focus and execution takes place and the results happen. And then in the middle, we have an expectation around leaders, whether we're in our own business or not, that they're going to continue to be more and more effective. That they'll work on their effectiveness. So, fulfilling the promise of leadership, what it means to be an effective leader, and ultimately where we spend our time as a purpose is we want to create a world of work where people thrive. Okay. Now, that's a foundation. Let's talk a little bit about more specifics on that, of what we've done. Four areas of focus. Leadership, three areas of focus. Leadership effectiveness, transformational change, and performance enhancement. So as an example, last year we got a project with uh, Regent Cruise Lines. Regent Cruise Lines is a five-star luxury cruise company that has smaller ships and their whole model is intimacy based. If you go on a cruise with them, you're going to be better taken care of of anywhere that you can go, period. They provide experience. Now they have cruises literally all over the world to the best places. Guess where their call center is? Omaha, Nebraska. So I want you to think about this for a minute. Their call center is in Omaha, Nebraska, and the people that are buying their services probably represent the top five to seven percent of the wealth in our country. They're in the top five to seven percent. They're way up there. Some of them much higher than that, top two to three percent. And they're calling to a call center in Omaha, Nebraska, where someone's making about twelve to fourteen dollars an hour after they've been there a number of years, and they're booking a cruise why well, don't you think about this a minute? They're booking a cruise with me answering the phone at $12 to $14 an hour that's going to cost more for seven days than I make in an entire year. I want you to think about that. I'm on the phone talking to this really wealthy person, which we had the opportunity to listen into a lot of these calls, and they're going to book a cruise that is more money on average than I make in an entire year. Now, if they book a world cruise, the top world cruise sold for $330,000. That meant that somebody actually is wealthy enough with enough free time on their hands, they can spend six months on a cruise ship, which blew my mind, and go all over the world. $330,000. By the way, talking to a reservation agent on the other end of the line that makes about $14 an hour and is sitting there thinking to themselves as they're doing the math, I don't make a cent off of the sale I just made. Now that's way unusual. I mean, there's, well, they have a world cruise that fills up every year, so it's not that unusual, but it's not the biggest part of who they are. They ask us if we would come in and help change that culture and understand that it needed to be a sales instead of a call center culture, and that we would actually put together an incentive system so that from an organizational perspective, people would start to see a return on the effort put out. We spent a year in there. In one year, by just changing the call structure, putting in an incentive system and working with the reservation agents, which by the way, there was only 50 of them, they increased their sales by 23%, which resulted in $41 million one year. That was last year. Now they're actually sold out of cruises. It worked really, really well, so we got a different problem in hand. They're happy to have the problem, but they've got to solve it. But think about the culture mismatch there and what's going on from a leadership perspective and the way that works. That's one example of what we do in performance enhancement. Transformational change. Uh, largest project right now is, uh, believe it or not, Utah State grad, um, Yale University. And I've got a bunch of other Utah State grads working with me there, as well as one Utah State professor that we hired. It's really wonderful because I always considered Yale quite a ways away from Logan, New Haven, Connecticut, and Logan, and the Ivy League quite a ways away from Logan. In fact, I'm not even sure they would have let me apply, let alone get in. But now we're responsible for redesigning the way Yale operates. We've been in there about a year and a half. Everything that's back of the house that has to do with the business of Yale, they have to totally transform because it doesn't serve them anymore. And what they found is that their business aspect of Yale, Yale is actually so poorly run that it's choking the ambitions of Yale and the growth they want to achieve over the next several years. 
that's a project we're working on right now. Today we're down in, uh, we're in New Haven, Connecticut working today. We're down in uh, Georgia working today. We've got all of the IT group from McDonald's there, and uh, there's 60 top leaders, <coughs> and we're helping them become more effective as leaders. Those are the kind of projects we work on. This is very convenient to walk back and forth. That's that high tech. Once we get the Huntsman stuff, we're going to be in great shape. <laughs> How cool is that? Here's our strategy and our business model. Um, I started Maxcom with a Utah State professor in 1983. Thought it was a really cool thing to hire a professor for the following reasons. Um, they didn't need much money. And they had a lot of time on their hands. And if they were really competent, we were going to get a lot of effort and build a business together. And plus, I had a professor that made a huge difference in my life when I went to school here and came back and we started the business together 23, 24 years ago. Our strategy when we went into it within the first year or so is that we're going to become trusted advisors to, to, to CEOs primarily and C-level leaders. Why? Why do you think that was our strategy? Come on. Let you know when it's rhetorical. Why? That are going to give you your business, and if, you're, if they trust you enough, they're going to refer you to other people. Get a good networking out there, and. 90% of the time, you're right on. 90% of the time, who do you think don't? Who do you think is not budget constrained inside a corporation? The CEO. 90% of the time, we can get projects approved outside of budget. There's another piece of that. In order for an organization to actually change, for it to become better, for both the people that work in it and for the customers that serve, who do you have to have commitment from? The top leaders. Absolutely. So that's where we started. Our office was uh, down by the Eccles Performing Arts Center in the old, uh, geez, I think it was uh, Keith O'Brien's building or something. We were right next to the Elks Lodge. And uh, usually around Saturday, Early in the morning, we had a whole different set of issues to contend with next to the Elks and the Benevolent Protected Order of the Elks. And we sat there in this little office, and I remember sitting there with Emil, who was my partner, and said, by this time next year, I'm going to have my first CEO. And by that time next year, I had a guy by the name of Mac McGriff, and he was our first CEO. He ran a corporation called Alliance Mortgage Corporation in Jacksonville, Florida. And that's the manifestation of that strategy. Customer intimacy, we're very customer intimate. That means that for us, it's all about high touch. Focus on leadership effectiveness, transformational change, and performance enhancement. Play big, stay small, high impact work. We want to make sure that whatever we take on, it's high impact so that we can what? Get the results and have long-term relationship. We don't want the other work because we're small. We absolutely have a strategy in here that we want to play big and stay small. There's 12 of us with a group of another 30 or 40 that we use as colleagues that are subcontractors and we work with that group across. We do about six million in revenue. Large projects and feeder engagements. For a small firm, 80% of our revenue in any given year will be one or two clients. Right now our largest client is Yale, revenue wise. Our business model, small 12 to 15 core internal staffs, A players, we have a few aren't A players right now. We're looking for a director of operations. Cindy suggested that when we came up here, there might be a budding director of operations sitting in the room. We need one. It's a great gig. I'll give you my card. If you think you're a possibility, let us know. We'll talk to you about it. I'm not kidding. LLC partnership model, internal external delivery model. We want to deliver a 50 to 50 ratio of internal to external. In other words, people that work for us full time are delivering half of our business. People that are contractors to us deliver the other half. Professional service, 60% gross margin, don't have to explain that. Professional service contractors, colleague network 30 to 40, and scalable repeatable work product. We're working on that one really hard right now. That's Cindy's main job. The professional services contractors, we've got uh, our graphics folks are out of New York. We use them when we need them. Our writer, one out of California. Uh, another editor out of here in Salt Lake, another one out of Connecticut. We've got three that we use all the time. Um, people that we use to do assessment for us do that for a living. So if we go in to do an assessment inside the organization, we use that kind of professional service contractors. So that's the model we work off of. That's our customers. That's 23 years of them. Um, interesting crew. There's uh, 
Well, I figured it out when I was coming up here because I thought it was interesting for me to just take a look at. And that's our current customer base. These are the folks we consider to be our customers over the years. This is our current customer base. That's the companies we're working with. This is a startup that went public about two years ago, communication company down in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, one local client, life insurance company, we're doing a large transformation effort. We do all the leadership development for McDonald's. Um, all of the leadership, the high potential development for them. I told you about the Yale project. Region is still a customer and USXL is a, a startup that's going to go public in a year or so. So here's our history. On the left, that's a list of clients. On the right, last 23 years we've worked with over 300 companies, 100 CEOs as clients, representing over a million employees, and we've sold about $70 million worth of consulting. So, I've done about 80% of the sales. The reason I ring that up is sales is a higher calling. If you can't sell, you can't be in business. And uh, don't ever think the sales isn't a good thing. It's a great thing, especially when you don't have anything coming in. We really get serious about that. So that's who we are. That's what we do. Let's talk for about 10 minutes before we go into question and answers. And I'll give you a little bit about the path here. That's entire class of Southridge High. And being the student by president, Southridge High was not tough. This was not, this was not like I had to go out after a lot of votes. There was uh, 13, 14, 15 kids in my senior class at Southridge. And uh, the ratio to boys and girls, men and women, was definitely not good. There was five guys and two of my classmates got killed. Um, I was a student body president and that was a big deal to me for this reason. I love the area of leadership and in 1973 when I graduated from high school, I get invited to a leadership program up in Logan Canyon at the Forest Service Camp, uh, which my mother had told me all those years was actually a camp for delinquent children and as we would drive over to the ranch that I was raised on on the east side of Bear Lake, she would threaten me with, God rest her soul, if you don't straighten up, I'll leave you here. When I was 18, I ended up there. And then it was about that time, I think, not a lot earlier I found out it actually wasn't for delinquents, it was a forest service camp. I went to an experiential outdoor course for leaders, for student leaders, and uh, I remember very clearly thinking, it was run by the ASUSU from here, and I remember very clearly thinking, I don't know exactly what this is, but this is what I want to do with my life. I love this work and oriented everything from that point forward to do that work and that's what we're in the business of doing now. At Utah State, when I got here, I followed through with the leadership side with ASUSU, worked really hard on the business side, went from the business school over to the communication school, and my experience at Utah State, because I was oriented towards what I wanted to end up being, was very directly related to what I believe has helped us be as successful as we are and we've had our ups and downs. No question about that. This was a huge experience for me. Question mark is how do you take advantage of the fact that you're going to spend four to six years here to help you do what you want to do? Even if you're a senior, how do you just take advantage of the next year and orient yourself towards that? Makes all the difference in the world. Here's our history. First three years, I purchased a small health food store down here so that we can fund it. We launched Maxcom in 83. And um, <laughs> our first client in the door was Logan City Water Department. And uh, we're working down at the first dam, right there where the water goes over. And our job was to help them put together some communication. We were making $50 an hour. And uh, we had a guy there that was our manager. We called him Burnham Don because he checked us on how many copies we made and whether or not we would be reimbursed for them. That was our first gig, and our second large gig, our first large client, ended up being Blue Cross Blue Shield of Florida. And we took on a large-scale transformation then, and they were my employer before I started my own business, two before, and they paid us more as a company in one project than I made the entire time I worked for them. I never could figure that out. I never could figure out why they would take my advice from the outside coming in but when I was there, not want to listen to it. That's why I went to the outside. Corporations are one of my favorite things. All right, but I'm not a good employee. 
entrepreneurial terror. Um, I've been doing it 23 years. How many of you believe I feel like we're stable? Stable. We're going to be paid next week. Let me define being an entrepreneur for you. Someone that's willing to work really, really hard and not make any money. Some of the time. And you have to be in a position to do that. It's either hell or heaven or somewhere in between all the time. And I've had both of those. I've flown on my clients' private jets. I've gone all over the world. I've done the whole thing. And I've sat in a position after being in business for 12 years and wondered where the next client was going to come from. Transformed the organization a number of times. We have to actually practice what we preach. Being an entrepreneur is really, really, really an exciting, challenging, wonderful thing. And it's got its own series of issues. Six in a million, an idea for a startup becomes and goes public. Lots of challenges in here. Beating unbelievable odds. 44% of new employee firms survive four years or more. There's 649,700 new firms in 2006. 549,000 closures in 2006. Starts and closures of employee firms, 95 for 2003. New firms, firm closures and bankruptcies. I actually think those are great odds. That's the part I love about this. I had a 50 to 60% chance of succeeding if I come up with the right ideas and do the right things. But it is a huge challenge and a huge opportunity. So let's skip ahead here. So I want to get to some questions and answers and tell you a little bit about what I think we have learned over the years. First thing, figure out how to stay in the game. If you're going to start a business for yourself, before you go into it, get your thoughts together on how you're going to be able to sustain it long enough to be successful. There are not a lot of overnight successes. How many have no icon here in, here in Cache Valley? Okay, Scott Watterson, Gary Stevenson, I grew up with them when I lived in Logan before I moved over to South Rich and Ranch. Um, when they got back from their church missions, one of them was the delivery guy one day and one of them was a sales guy. They started the business on $5,000, invested by three people. They were selling marble. We would go to Denver. Scott would walk in one day and he would be the delivery guy dressed up in the jeans. And Gary would walk in and he'd be the sales guy dressed up in the suit. And they were traded back and forth and they started out importing marble from Taiwan and build it into a major business. They figured out how to sustain that business over time and did a wonderful job. They knew how to stay in the game and built it into a huge organization. That's the first one. The second one, business, like life, is a series of relationships. And the quality of those relationships, how good you are in relationship, is directly proportionate to how effective and successful you be as well as how fulfilled you are. How good are you in relationship? Do those that you're closest to appreciate you as a friend, a colleague, an advisor, someone that listens to them, someone they can trust, someone that's loyal to them? Do you know what it takes to have an effective relationship? Are you actively implementing those things in your day-to-day -day lives? Do you extend yourself on behalf of others? Do you go out of your way any given day to do something for somebody that it's unexpected? What are those things that build quality relationships that last over time? My biggest client I met in 1989 He's produced for our organization $20 million in business. He is still one of my very best friends. All these years later. He retired, he's still bringing his business. All of that's based on the relationship and the fact that we delivered. And the quality relationship is just huge. Just huge. Know what you believe and be grounded in your beliefs. What is important to you? What do you believe in? Because an entrepreneur, you're going to be challenged and excited in many ways. And when it really gets down to it, what's most important to you is what you have to be grounded in. What are those things that are very most important to you, more important than anything else? Be grounded in your beliefs. Know what they are. For me, it absolutely is critical. I've had it and I've lost it several times in my life. And when I am not grounded in my own belief system, 
I'm less successful. And a ton less fulfilled. A ton less fulfilled. Surround yourself with successful people that take personal responsibility. What do I mean by that? What's your name? Chad. What do you think I mean by that, Chad? Chad. Okay, good. What else? What do you think I mean by personal responsibility up here? Chad's got part of it. Say you make a fault, you're mad enough to take it. Perfect. Absolutely. We're not talking about being partially responsible, 95% responsible, being responsible for what it is we create in our lives. If I'm with people that take personal responsibility for the outcomes in their lives that are successful, my success and the opportunity that we have to impact people goes way up. And you all know people are not responsible in their lives. That everything else is somebody else's problem. The reason I'm not doing what I need to do today is not my fault. Fill in the blank. I mean, got some in our own family sometimes, don't we? <laughs> yeah. We'll start talking about that one. Last one. Keep growing, do whatever it takes to stay self-aware. Number one issue we find in the leaders that we work with inside organizations contributing to them not succeeding is they are not self-aware of their impact on other people. They get to a point where they lose their awareness. Because you know, when you get in a certain stage, whether it's because of money or power or authority or whatever it is, the chances of getting feedback and being really self-aware start to diminish proportionally. Do whatever you can to be self-aware. It'll make all the difference. Now, let me give you one sense of that and I'm going to finish up here in a minute. Um, how many of you have one person in your life that will give you honest feedback about how you're showing up? Yeah? A few of us? Some of us won't raise our hands, don't blame you. Have one person in your life today that will give you honest feedback about how you show up versus telling you what you want to hear. You need those kinds of people in your life. And you need to appreciate them because feedback about how we're showing up and what we're doing is truly a gift. It makes all the difference in our ability to be self-aware and adjust who we are and how we show up in order for us to be more fulfilled and more successful. Cultivate those kind of relationships. Goes hand in hand with the very top item on the quality relationships. You got friends in your life that uh, don't want to hear how they're doing? Yeah? Do you ever have, try to have a conversation when somebody's having a real difficult time and they don't want to hear it? You care enough that you want to have that conversation? Cultivate those kind of relationships. Makes all the difference. Made a huge difference for me. I've got my best friend sitting in the back of the room, and man, am I grateful. Um, she kicks my butt on a regular basis and uh, does it very effectively. And against 250 and 100 pounds, it's an unfair fight. All right. This is how I feel about entrepreneurial leadership, being an entrepreneur. I feel like no matter how far I've gone, no matter how many millions of dollars in sales we've had as an organization, no matter how many times we've successfully delivered over and over and over again, that we're always perched on the edge of success. And we can easily fall off. Federal Express asked us one time to bid on a project. I bid, this is early on, I bid $56,000. They came back to me and said they wanted to spend 3000 I sort of missed that one just by a little bit, just about 97%. That kind of stuff happens all the time. Happens all the time. We did a leadership assessment uh, with the CFO from NASA and the CFO from Yale University about uh, two months ago and uh, three months ago, and they got them mixed up. They sent the CFO from NASA the stuff for the CFO from Yale and set the CEO, CFO from Yale the stuff for the CFO from NASA. They weren't that happy with us. The calls started flying around 3 o'clock Friday afternoon. It was 80% of our revenue was dependent on these relationships. And we blew it. It was that simple of a ball being dropped. We took all the personal data this year, 
These things happen. You want them. a ton of information about one of our larger clients over the years, huge publicly held or privately held company, and uh, we sent all of it to the person's old address at their old corporation. It was a bunch of their really, 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 really private information. The package ended up in the wrong office in the wrong place. Three binders of it. Because in our office we sent it from the wrong spot. You're always perched on the edge of success and it's amazing what little things can cause a huge problem. Two years ago we had a glitch in our data program a year and a half ago in our <coughs> database program and we sent out what 670? 670 postcards with people's address and phone number and um, home address and birth dates on it. And it was sending them out, out of a database coming out of Singapore and there was another 3,000 in the queue and they couldn't stop it. So not only did we have over 600 go out, we had another 3,000 that were in the queue. They had to shut down the entire database program to not send out the other 3,000. We're only one of thousands of their clients. And this stuff's going out all over the United States, all over the world with private information on it. And we're just watching our business and our relationships, customer intimacy, intimacy trusted advisor, and you just sent out my social security number and my address and my phone number and my birth date and I'm going to trust you with my corporation? A players don't make mistakes as often as C players do. Precariously perched on the edge all the time. Appreciate spending the time with you. We've got about, what, 15 minutes or so for questions and answers? Jump in. Aside from uh, having those friends, those honest friends around you, how else do you create self-awareness? Uh, I go several times a year to something that uh, really interrupts my thinking about who I am. So I feel like it's really important to always go back and be a student. And when I go years without going back to be a student, I get pretty caught up in myself. But when I go to a place that requires me to be a student again to actually show up and get how affected I've been, it always interrupts my thinking. It always interrupts my thinking. That's an important one for me. Uh, my family's a big deal for my self-awareness. Um, Cindy and I work really hard on cultivating an honest environment with our four children. And um, they give us a lot of feedback. I got two kids. <laughs> hate to even admit it. We got two kids out of BYU right now. It hurts me. It pains me to pay the tuition checks. So I have to admit it. Kills me. I've always hated BYU. Um, <laughs> I used to sit in the spectrum on the front row and just scream at Danny Ainge. I hated BYU. And they're going there. But they have no problem. Uh, it's good education. They actually think I'm an alumni at BYU. They keep asking me to come down and speak at the Marriott School. And I say, I'm not alumni. And they keep thinking that I am. And I don't know what that is. But uh, anyway, long story. My kids, my kids do a great job of giving us feedback. Cindy does a great job of helping me be self-aware. Um, it's just really cultivating those kind of relationships where you interrupt your thinking on a regular basis. Welcome. Appreciate it, sir. Oh, no problem. What else? Please, jump in. Um, what is the one way that you always find new customers? Um, what is some of the most, more successful ways, I guess? I started keeping track when I was in college of people that I was going to be in a relationship with over the years and stayed in touch with them. So literally, my personal database uh, is around 3,500 people. And uh, I would say out of that group, there is what I call my C1 list. Out of that group, I've got about um, seven or 800 I'm actively in relationship with. And I do that electronically. Um, I do that by sending out uh, newsletters, cards, but I stay in touch with them. And when we need business, when we're in a business development mode, 80% of our business comes from relationships that we've had for as many as 20, 25 years. But I stayed in touch with and in contact with. We got two people that manage our database uh, in the organization, uh, make calls out. We're constantly working. We want to know where people are and we want to stay in touch with them. That's the high intimacy piece for us. And that's the majority of where our business comes from. 
And you know what? We're a small firm, so you saw we have six or seven clients at any given time. We're going to double our size. We want to go to about 12 million in sales, uh, but you know we want to do 12 million in sales with only 15 people inside. So that's uh, important for us to have those kind of relationships. What else? Go ahead, jump right in. Uh, in your consulting, do you find leaders for companies as well if they're looking for them or not? Yes. yes. Uh huh. Yeah, we. Um, we can get brought in a whole host of different ways, but in, on, a, on a regular basis, uh, we're asked to help find leaders and, and good people for organizations. Do you do that on your own? Do you do your own networking with people you know? Or do you I never hire, I never help uh, another client have their people leave. Here's the way I view it. Um, if you're working for McDonald's and you're miserable, my first <laughs> and you would be at some McDonald's, I know that. But in Illinois, you might not be. My first priority is to you as my client. And if you're miserable and it's the wrong place for you to be, I'll help you find a job. But I have to be straight with my client about it. Because the truth is that you're not going to do a good job for him if you hate what you're doing. So I take, the, I take the individual first and the client second unless we've agreed to something different. But I always have that conversation with my CEO or whoever I'm working for. Here's a, here's a rule of thumb for me. I never surprise my CEOs. Worst possible thing I can do is surprise my CEO. If I'm surprising him, I'm in trouble. Um, it's never worked for me. I've never had one time that I surprised the CEO that it worked. It just hasn't ever worked for me. I always um, don't feel good about that. I don't know why. And mostly because they don't want to look stupid or lose face, but I get it. So, What else? Failures. Have you ever consult somebody and not be able to do it? Biggest, uh, the most scary thing for us was when people actually started listening to us. That scared the hell out of us. Um, because then we, we would give recommendations and they would implement them and all of a sudden talking about being personally responsible. Um, yeah, actually we have done a few things over the years and you're going to when you see a client list like that and you work with them. One in particular is that I gave uh, advice to a CEO on a hire that I was absolutely sure was going to be the perfect hire and uh, the guy embezzled from me three years later. Um, my relationship was strong enough that it survived it, but uh, it was a big deal. It was a big deal and I am really careful on my advice on people to hire now on personal recommendation. Um, we put in a incentive system for Blue Cross Blue Shields call center and uh, it absolutely fell flat on its face and worked in the opposite direction. We drove results the wrong way and uh, we were blown away. We had no idea that was going to happen. And it wasn't what we thought it would be and uh, we were scramble mode. We had to make up for it very quick and that took us a year to dig out. Uh, Lowe's Anatole Hotel, when I was in business three years, uh, two and a half years when we were broke, we were broke. I mean, we made it, we were, we're staying in the game. Uh, we did a performance contract with them and guaranteed them that we'd pay them X amount of dollars if we didn't get the results. We got the results and then the economy tubed on them. And um, the CEO of Lowe's Anatole Hotel said, there's a quick $300,000, let's get it out of his pocket. And uh, that was a huge mistake. And we had to pay him back. It took us two years to make up for that 300 grand. And it's like, whoa, okay, that was a, you know, those lessons are really, um, they're really, really good lessons, but man, you gotta be able to weather them. I mean, they just kick your ever-loving butt. It's like, you gotta be kidding me. And we get in these situations, Cindy and I, Cindy and I are business partners, and uh, sometimes you go through those periods of time where the next time the phone rings, you just figure it's another one. Like, what is this gonna be about what we just found out? Last year we had our uh, organization audited, and um, they opened up one year, the IRS did, then they decided to open up two other years. And so they opened up three years of auditing, and by the advice of one of our CPA firms, we had taken $500,000 in write-offs two consecutive years. Write-downs of assets that no longer existed the IRS, so they wanted to um, make it so that we couldn't take those write-offs and avoid that. That means they want me to give them back a half a million dollars, essentially. Right? They want me to put $500,000 of assets back on the book that don't exist. It took us $15,000 a month and six months of fighting them, lawyers and accountants. We finally prevailed, but the mistake was we were sloppy. We hadn't kept track of our inventory. So when we'd buy a laptop and it would go out the right door being sold, we didn't inventory it out and inventory it in. 
and it almost cost us a half a million dollars. It cost a ton of my time. And you're sitting across from an IRS agent and they're asking you stupid questions like, why do you have 17 phone lines? Well, because I have 17 people. They work for me. Why do you have a 415 area code? Well, because there's one in San Francisco. I mean, that was the kind of stuff we went through for six months, all because we were stupid and we're sloppy and running our business. And yeah, man, it just keeps going. And then with, you said you give bids for your clients. Do you ever um, see that in how well they do? Uh, we just did on the region project. Hopefully we'll get paid within the next two weeks. It will, uh, the payment that we'll get out of this region project for the increase in revenue will be equal to half a year's revenue for us. And uh, that's, but that's the first time it's worked for us in 23 years. They, the problem with performance-based consulting is that if you don't have everything completely nailed up front in the contract, the minute you get successful and you talk about it at the back end, they want to revisit the agreement. And out of the six or seven times I've done, that's been the case every time. This is not that case this time. Well, uh, you'll know. I mean, you know, if I'm pissed in a week from now, we didn't get our money yet. So I don't know, but I think we'll get it. Others. I love being an entrepreneur. I wouldn't do anything else. Even when I think about not working myself, we've got four businesses right now, and we love every minute of it. So it's a great way to live your life. But it is not for everybody. We just brought a guy in that's been in corporate for 30 years, and he's looking at us, and we're thinking everything's going well. He's saying, man, I don't know if you guys are going to make it another year. Well, I don't know. We've made it 23. I think we'll probably be here. Um, but it's a totally different risk profile. And I really, really enjoy it. I love what I do. How would you... Uh well, how self-aware are they? Question. <laughs> First area is that uh, the leaders around you have to be willing to want to be helped. And uh, some are and some are not. Uh, we're in business because the majority of the ones we deal with uh, need the help and something wakes them up to get the help. The majority of the time when we go into an organization, either a leader is wanting to become more and more effective, which is a small percentage of it, the rest of the time is because they're being very ineffective. We work mostly with ineffective leaders. I'm like a cop in corporate America. Cops have a very jaded view of the world because you know what they deal with every day, right? They deal with a different segment of the population. We deal with leaders that uh, really need help. But quite honestly, um, there's not any leader that I've ever worked with that couldn't become more effective. How about in our own leadership skills? How would you recommend for us to work Do everything you can to learn how to have the most impact on people possible in a way that really works for them. And be very grounded in what it is that you believe so that you show up day to day and keep your word. Do everything you can to learn more and more about leadership. There are opportunities to learn about leadership in everything we do every day all the time, right? Um, keep your word. Make promises and keep them. Know what the promises are you're being held accountable for. Get really good at keeping your promises. Please. Who are some of the other people in the education business or the leadership business who you look up to? As Dean Anderson. I think he's an incredible guy. Um, Warren Bennis. Uh, is someone that Cindy and I both appreciate uh, immensely. Uh, Chris Arduous um, influenced our work in a big way. Uh, Meg Wheatley influenced our work in a big way. Uh, leadership in the new science. Um, but the people that we really look up to are really great leaders that are willing to put it out on the line. I mean, you know what, there's not anything like going into an organization where the leader is really, really respected. I mean, I had this leader, uh, the guy I was telling you about earlier, the one that's been my friend for all these years, his name was Steve Ewing. And um, I'll close on this, unless there's time for more questions, I'll be happy to take them. I was in the boardroom in Detroit, Michigan. Uh, boardroom, if you've ever been in one, you know, is a really interesting place. Big tables, you know, thick tables, carpet, the whole deal, right? And um, it's kind of intimidating the way that they set up boardrooms. There's no intimacy in it. And they served lunch in this boardroom a day. That was about... Uh, 18 people in the room, and in walked one of the waiters, and um, he had two trays of condiments. And these two trays of condiments had on them little bowls of mustard and mayonnaise and ketchup and all the stuff you'd want, the condiments and pickles and, you know, the whole spread, corporate spread. 
He's walking across the room and this important meeting's going on with really wealthy people running big businesses, right? I mean, you know, they get way too caught up in themselves and we all have to watch that. Humility is an important part. And as he's walking across the room, he dropped it. And I mean, I'm telling you, it was one of those places like kind of sort of like doing something in church you shouldn't do. I mean, it was like, whoa. And I'm not kidding, within a split second, Steve Ewing was up off of his table, of his chair, down on one knee, and picking stuff up and cleaning the floor. He's the CEO. He turned to the guy and he said, man, when I was a waiter, I was dropping, excuse my language, shit all over the place. He said, that's got to be really embarrassing. Don't even worry about it. Let me help you finish cleaning it up. Now, this guy makes more money than anybody in 10,000 person organization. He's on his knees cleaning up the ketchup. And the main is, I respect those leaders because they understand it's about extending yourself on behalf of other people, keeping your word, and making sure that the organization's focused on the results it has to get, but it's still about human beings. Now, there's another part to this story. What do you think was the rumor and word in the organization in Detroit, Michigan for the next? 48, 72 hours about Steve Ewing. How long do you think it took that entire organization to know what he had done that day? And what happened to the respect level they had for him? It's not why he did it, obviously. But his image just went up multiples. Much more than his image would have gone up if he had done another really good deal on Wall Street. So, <laughs> leadership's human. It really is, and there's, no, there's not a direct science to it that works. It's all different for everyone. It's the most studied thing and the least understood. How are we doing on time? You can take it upstairs if you want. We'll do whatever you guys want to do. Any more questions? Just one. What two books would you recommend? I have one. Um, no, I'm kidding you, but I do have one. <laughs> right now, um, I'm going to give you the book of Cindy and I wrote, but uh, right now one of, well, I just, you know, as far as leadership goes, um, any one of Warren Bennis's books I love, but uh, Warren Bennis on being a leader is my favorite. And it's a little paperback and it's just really, 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 really good. Um, as far as uh, what it takes to really make an organization turn around that I still love is From Worst to First, which is about Continental Airlines. I've read that a number of times and I love that. On uh, the leadership side of things, um, Leadership is an Art by Max Dupree is a classic for me. How about you, Cindy? One of your favorites? Agile leadership from the new one went out. Excellent. The leadership quality, rather. I mean, we literally, uh, Cindy, in my office, you, uh, I would guess that we've got about, a, about, I don't know how many, a lot. Thousands of books. Hand those out. Brought your book. We're in the process of uh, writing two more now. And um, this is a book that Cindy and I wrote years ago when we were really working on what it took to turn around organizations from an organizational change perspective. And uh, also brought you the newsletter that we give out to our clients and our database. But this one's personal because it's about our own transformational change. We actually had to practice what we preach, which really sucked. Um, you know, that was one of those where the uh, choir needed a little preaching to, and this tells you about that. Absolutely. Hey, take advantage of Utah State. It's got a lot to offer, and it's a wonderful place to go to school. I loved it. Appreciate spending time with you today. Thank you very much.